Welcome to episode 268 of CBP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Rob. But you know what I just realized? What's that? We would say the, pod- the, the C++ podcast originally, mm-hmm. right? Now we say the first because CBP chat became a regular podcast. But do we know for a fact that there was actually no one before us? Doing C plus plus podcasting, um, I don't know for certain, but I would think someone would have corrected us by now if that were the case. Uh, I know there's certainly you know more general programming podcasts that have done episodes on C plus plus, but I, don't, I think we were the first dedicated to it. Yeah. Okay. Just I don't know why that just struck me. <laughs> Okay, well, at the top of the episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we got a, a long email today. I'm going to kind of summarize parts of it. But it's from Harold saying, Jason, I'm currently doing C++ for mobile at work and enjoyed the cross-platform mobile technology or telephony uh, episode a lot, which we did recently with uh, Dave Hagedorn. And then he goes, goes on to say, C++ on mobile is interesting and seems to be a difficult topic. The Ginny people who have been on your show, but now uh, the project is read-only and not maintained. There's also Bowden. Uh, we did an episode with them a while back, uh, but that also is apparently not maintained anymore, and its future is uncertain. But he points out that Ginny is not totally abandoned, and there is a fork uh, that has been getting some ongoing development. So if you've been interested in any of the episodes we've done where we mentioned Ginny as a cross-platform uh, framework for C++ on mobile, check out, uh, it's github.com cross-language-cpp Ginny. Uh, and they're you know, saying they're a small team, but they're using Ginny in all their projects, and they're trying to work on some of the like outstanding PRs that Dropbox never fixed. So uh, yeah, pretty cool that there there is some ongoing investment in that work. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so uh, he also says, uh, by the way, if um, you are in C++, there's also a mobile dev channel on the CPP language Slack, so definitely go check that out. Okay, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or emails at feedback at cpcast.com, and don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Jens Veller. Jens is the organizer and founder of Meeting C++, doing C++ since 1998. He is an active member of the C++ community, from being a moderator at c++.de, an organizer of his own C++ user group since 2011 at Dusseldorf. His roots are in the C++ community. Today, his main work is running C- Meeting C++ platform, the conference, website, social media, and recruiting. His main role has been being a C++ evangelist, and he speaks and travels to other conferences and user groups around the world. Jens, welcome back to the show. Hey. Nice to be back. At least in a normal nice. year, you travel and go to all the conferences around the world, huh? Uh, yeah, that, that part <laughs> changed a bit. Uh, we'll do that just, next year again, hopefully. Just out of curiosity, how many plane tickets did you cancel this year? How many had you already bought and then had to cancel? Not a single one. Really? I... Um, I, I planned to 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 skip on uh, aspen the conference because last year oh, okay. was kind of they've they've moved in a week earlier and that's giving me some conflicts and um i plan to to skip that this year and go to other conferences and i somehow was lazy with booking my <laughs> planned holiday <laughs> so i didn't uh, invest any time in having to wonder about that and i was kind of you know um very early, I uh, had this on the radar when, when like the first news came in that something's popping up in China. I was okay. We remember SARS, and now we will see uh, if we get lucky again or not. Right. And so I kind of did not, uh, from that point on, invest in any bookings or travel. Well, that's fortunate. I uh, definitely was not so lucky, but I should have a bunch of airplane credit. It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah also this summer too. traveling Sorry, is ahead. not so much part and of my, my daily uh, routine anymore as it used to be. Right. Um, okay, well, Jens, we are a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and I'll start talking more about uh, meeting C++ this year, okay? 
Okay. All right. This first one we have is uh, codingcards.org. And this is a, a cool little website where you can learn some of the new features being added in C++20. And it's got a built-in, you know, uh, editor for typing in code and you can you know run it and uh, kind of learn how some of the new features work uh, it, it gives you prompts to, to do different type of coding examples and if you can't figure something out on your own you can get a solution so I thought this was a pretty neat little tool yeah that was fun I, I played with just the first couple of cards I didn't spend a ton of time on it but yeah definitely fun interesting yeah I didn't see how many there were in total uh, no actually I just got on the first card, but I don't know if it's the first card. Maybe they they go randomly, um, and solved that and looked at the uh, solution. Um, I think it's, it could be improved in, in a few ways. Like you you don't know the standard, you don't, don't really have uh, like an um, control over some things. But it's a neat idea. Yeah, definitely a neat idea. Okay, uh, next thing we have is a blog from uh, Jonathan Mueller, Funathan, uh, and this is a blog post on immediately invoked function expression for metaprogramming. And uh, it's a concept that I think we've talked about a little bit before on the show, the uh, immediately invoked lambdas, uh, but he kind of came up with a new use for it, which is interesting. I had not seen this uh, directly before. It is, so he's using decal type for the call of immediately invoked lambda to generate a new type, effectively. So it requires C++ 20s, lambdas, and unevaluated context, um, and a little bit of trickery to work around some of like decal vel's limitations. It's very close to the techniques that Hannah uses in mm. um, CTRE to generate types. And after seeing Hannah do it, and honestly, it took me like three times of watching her talks to understand what was going on, uh, then I tried playing with that. And now uh, Jonathan is like, you know, those techniques involve like creating a free function that would generate the type back for you. You say so you don't actually call the function. You just pretend like you're going to call the function and say, what would be the type of the result of this if I had called this function? And Jonathan took this to the next uh, step and just said, well, why make a function if the only point is to generate a type for you? We can just now in C++20 slap that into a, into a lambda. That is how I understand this. Yeah. Um, so the interesting part is like his solution only works in C++20. Mm -hmm. But when mm -hmm. I read the blog post, I found it very neat that he also provides a C++17 solution, which basically is a freestanding function. And I was not aware about the connection to HANA's work, but that's really nice to know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next thing we have is a uh, GitHub repository, and this is Sugar PPP, which is uh, syntactic sugar for programming C++. And this is pretty cool. Uh, it looks like their goal is to kind of mimic some of the, uh, you know, syntax and features of Kotlin, which is a program language we've kind of mentioned a few times before on the show. Uh, and it looks like it was pretty successful. I, I wasn't familiar with this when clause in Kotlin, but it's kind of their version of a switch case, but uh, maybe a little bit more advanced. Yeah, also related to like Rust and functional programming languages pattern matching stuff. Right, which we're hopefully going to get in C plus plus twenty three. How similar is this to the pattern matching proposal? Do you remember? My impression is that it is quite similar. Okay. What's funny is yeah. I was. Go ahead, Yan. Sorry. Um, so I looked. I looked into that, and I. I just. It's not for me, okay? I, I think it's, it's a neat idea and it's something you can play around with and interesting to implement. I looked under the hood and I think uh, they should wrap this library in, a, in a, a namespace because it does have some very obvious names like is not uh, or something in, mm -hmm. in functions and types, uh, which is like exposing to the main namespace. And um, the this when construct, and I've, I've read some of the, the Reddit comments and that's how I kind of uh, 
the, the when construct looks neat and they seem to be using a little bit of uh, variance under the hood maybe probably for this to work um, but compared to a switch case it does not come for free so you should do some mm -hmm. measuring if that, the overhead is, is acceptable for you or if you just want to keep the old star until we have pattern matching in the language right yeah I, i've been so wanting pattern matching recently and then reading or at least looking over some of the the proposals for it and then we talked about it what last week rob i think we mentioned a little bit last week with emory yeah is that last week or the week yeah um and I was been thinking in the back of my head for like the last week, like I'm almost positive that you could write a library that would give you an expressive pattern matching construct currently today in like C plus plus twenty. Like I'm almost positive it's possible, but I hadn't actually sat down to to try. And then uh, and then seeing this pop up, I'm like, wow, this just came full circle for me. So I thought our listeners might find it interesting also. Yeah, but yeah, it's if you want to do something that can be done in a switch statement, use the switch statement. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's also not the only feature of this library, just for the record. It's just the main one that people are talking about. Yeah, it's also doing something with ranges here, right? Mm-hmm. And some I.O. utilities. I didn't really look at those as much because it was the pattern matching that really jumped out at me. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing we have uh, is this blog post and video from Jean-Hid Benid, who we've had on the show before, uh, about the C++ community. Um, if you, you know, follow C++ on, on Twitter or on Reddit, you've probably seen links to this. If you haven't already watched the video, I definitely encourage everyone to watch it. Um, you know, I... <laughs> Yesterday we're, we're three white guys, so I'm not sure how much more I want to say about uh, the experience of a, a black member of our community, other than just to say I'm kind of horrified as, as to what Johnny has experienced in the C++ community. You know, obviously we need to be better so that these types of things uh, don't happen. I don't know. Jason, Yan, do you have anything you want to add? Um, well, as a community organizer, I, I would like to... Uh... I would address some some uh, how how I how you know it's my point of view from how we can improve things and some things. Yeah. Uh, and I want to to thank uh, him for John Heat for just having the bravery to to speak up about this. And yeah, I think that um, most of us community organizers are happy to help with that and are happy to to improve the community and are willing to to listen to you if you reach out to us. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a follow-up on my, on my blog about this. Sounds That's good. I, think important. I, I want to say something. I don't know if it'll come across well or not, because sometimes I feel like I'm a complete moron when it comes to trying to express stuff like this. But um, I think it's easy, like, for us as three white guys to be like, oh, well, that just happened once, or, well, I've never seen that happen, so... I don't believe there's actually a problem because I've never seen it or I've never experienced it. Um, and even if you want to say, oh, well, that's just the experience of one person. This doesn't happen to everyone. But I think we've seen in the last six months or so, if you've been paying attention, if you've been reading Twitter, if you've been actually talking to people, that the number of uh, things that you, you could try to write off as just one person's experience is completely overwhelming. There's no way you can say that's just one person's experience because it's, you know, every uh, minority person that I know in the C++ community or in the world at this point has stories that right. are coming out that you're like, well, okay, well, you can't just say it's one person's experience anymore or, oh, that hasn't happened to me because it's like literally every minority that I know, depend, no matter how they are represented as a minority, has these stories. Yeah. Yes. That's definitely, yeah. It's, it's valid what he says. And also, I have, you know, know from other people having similar experiences in our community. So it's not like one person having a weird experience. No, no. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I I, I really value uh, Jean Heed as a member of our community. We've had him on the podcast twice, I think. I would uh, love to have him on again soon. Um, I know he's been doing some interesting things with uh, with rewriting Stood Vector. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so hopefully we can have him again, uh, have him on again soon, and maybe we uh, we'll talk about this in a little more detail with him when we have him on. Okay. Uh, so Jens, you are currently running a, a new survey, I think, right, on the Meeting C++ website. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes. I um, So three years ago, I had the idea for this tool because also kind of three years ago uh, was like when we had the first surveys coming out, which were run by serious organizations. Uh, so we, we do have a severe lack of data on C++ usage in the community, which is available to the public. Um, and so I, I had this idea about this two or three years ago, and last last winter during the Christmas break I implemented it. It's not an annual survey, it's a continuous survey, so um, that uh, your answers get uh, saved in an aggregate, and also as, as a single data point so that I can later do different aggregates on that and you can compare it. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, in-depth tool and um, other surveys which exist since 2017 are the ICCPP and the JetBrains survey and I think it's uh, important to kind of say that it's uh, really good that all those three surveys exist so we can compare data points and on the other hand um, my survey tool is continuous um, you get with every question you answer the next question and you get the result of the previous question and every question you get is random. Uh, so I have over 70 questions and I'm going to add more questions. Like one question I currently don't have is what standard features of C++20 do you use? Um, but I want to add that soon. So that's interesting. So you're saying you're uh, you're going to run this on an ongoing basis. You're never going to have like a final like surveys over. Here's the blog post of results type of thing. Yes, but I, I still can you know say this is oh, sure. understanding. <laughs> I, I can and and I, I do save your your vote with 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 the date connected to it, so I can right. extract uh, actually like a quarter a year. I I can say uh, you know who voted on that day if I wanted to. Um, I can say, um, and yeah, so the, the, the survey tool offers two modes, which like, uh, you, you don't need to log in, but then comes a captcha. And I also uh, gave CPPcast a link, so I guess it's in the show notes. Mm -hmm. If you click on it and you, you see the captcha because you're not logged into my site, you either can create an account or you can solve the captcha. Um, but extra for CPPcast, I created a bypass. If you enter CPPcast with capital uh, Cs, then the captcha is also solved. Okay, nice. I, don't, I think the, the bots are not listening here. So <laughs> um, the survey kind of, you know, gives you gives you then an ID, but this is like a random ID, and this is how the tool is based on that. Okay. Uh, what are you hoping to, to learn from the survey? You know, I, I think you mentioned that there's some other surveys done by, by JetBrains. Are you trying to glean any, like, additional information from from yours compared to what they uh, you know have derived. Well, first I think that all organizations which are are, are you know prone to a bias of their own. So mm -hmm. JetBrains asks certain questions and maybe they avoid certain other questions because that's not interesting to them. Same is true for ISOCPP and same is probably true for myself. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to to avoid that, but I uh, I noticed that one of the bias I am exposed to without noticing myself is just the community and the uh, the the part of folks which I reach which are actually willing to do the survey. And so um, right now I like I have a question about your. Uh, on which continent do you live? Because which country would be just too much to select? But um, so right now it's it's a bit biased towards towards Europe and in my own uh, survey. And on the other hand, I, I really found it interesting to ask for C plus plus feature usage, like language feature or um, library feature of a specific standard, and just see what features actually are getting used out there in, in like 
we, we never had data on that. Um, mm -hmm. The other part is that we, we don't have any knowledge about standard adoption, like from 2011 when the standard was ours to 2014, we don't know anything about that time frame. Um, and from 2014 to 2017, um, I, I'm not aware about a data set. It may, might exist, but as I said, I think the, the JetBrains uh, survey uh, started in 2017, asking questions like, which standard do you use? And um, so I think a lot of, of usage of this will turn out to be interesting when we are more like moving on into this decade and can see like how is the adoption for C++ 20 for 23 compared to to the data which we have on, since 17. So have you learned anything interesting so far about the adoption of C++ 20, for example? I think it's too early for 20. Um, okay. I found it interesting that with 11, the most used feature is unique pointer, and hmm. the second most uh, second most popular feature uh, in C++ 11 is shared pointer for the library features. So that makes me a little I mean, sad, honestly. Yeah, yeah, but it's also kind of telling. You know, we finally have a way to deal with heap allocations in the standard, and folks make use of that. That's it's kind of natural, but it's also kind of nice to see that data and to know what what is used and. Um, I don't have the question for C++ 20 yet. I have a question on um, how people plan or have adopted in the last year on standard usage. And actually, let me share my screen with you, then I can show that to you. Oh, that's oh, interesting. Okay. We've never had a guest share the screen before. Yeah, yeah I prepared for this. But... <laughs> I have to find it's over 70 questions that's now that I am well, um, we'll have to I, get yeah, some narration have here or will you be yeah. upgrading to a new C++ standard in the last or in the coming year okay so um, you see there's there's a lot of folks seemingly planning to upgrade to C++ 20 when it's out as you can see here that's um, great there's some people, you know, have upgraded to uh, C++ 11. There are some folks which plan to, and I want to, to say to those, move to 14. 11 is like a standard which you should only upgrade to if that's like your only option because yeah. you're running a weird yeah. compiler or some setting which prevents that. Um, or go for 17 if you can. You know, there's a lot of activity in 17, as we see. And for 20, um, there's a small amount of folks which have upgraded to and of course it's difficult to say if it's like the whole code base or if they you know just have like one one trial running with that um and it seems to be a popular uh, way to do that in the future definitely so and as as i you know lock the the answers over time we will be able to compare that in one year like do the the people which have planned to upgrade have they actually upgraded and we can probably compare this in the future you know how many people did upgrade in in this year compared to that year um so over time, I think we will have really, really interesting data points, uh, which uh, will be just available through having this as a continuous survey. Yeah, that's something I've um, said a few times as a best practice is skip C++11. If you don't upgrade to C++11 right now, I totally agree with that. There's, I mean, even people that I know who work in an extremely limited uh, compiler-supported environment, they want to have the like oldest support possible for their minimal set of hardware on embedded ARM platforms, or like, oh, yeah, you're right, we can enable the C++14 flag. And then they, they skip to 11, just like that. For them, it was easy, even, even though they were the most uh, restricted client I've worked with in a while. Good. Any other kind of really interesting takeaways as far as uh, other C++ features being used that you didn't expect to see? Um, there's 70 questions, so there's, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's, a, lot. there's a lot of things <laughs> which is interesting, and I, yeah. um, I like the time to go through it and to like pick pick out this. Like, I think it's like the question which is updating is really interesting the the feature usage is interesting i have multiple questions on the standard usage which is interesting there's the question on build systems where c make wins the day um i have some questions like on conferences which are like 
interesting for conference organizers like me probably and lots of other things in that survey all right I'll definitely encourage uh, listeners to click on that link and that'll be in the show notes to uh, to go fill up the survey themselves uh, so you have a couple other new things going on uh, do you want to tell us about meeting C++ online sure so as things moved online in C++ 2020 in this year um, I, I thought about you know what 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 you do with that because I wanted to have some experience for me C++ 2020 when we have this happening as an online event but I also thought that this is a new format and maybe you want to embrace it and as a community and use it as a chance to reach other folks which otherwise not would be able to uh, participate in a, in a live setting where you can communicate with folks and just watch the video otherwise or listen to the CPP cast for example and so it's a lineup of different events uh, once a month I host a user group in Remo the platform which also CPPCon uses but I also decided that from from the platforms I've seen it's, it's the best option to run online events in, and um, then this user group, the next meeting is next week on the 15th with Inbal Levy giving a talk on multi, uh, meta programming, not multi programming, meta, meta programming in C20. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that talk. And it's for me kind of also now uh, the experience that I finally have the talk to, the, the time to watch talks. Um, because you know, there's so many good videos out there. And I, either I can't decide what to watch or I'm just right now really busy with, with, with this, for example. I, you know, just This is mostly running on software, which I've written in the last weeks. Um, so, But there's also an online conference. Uh, the first online conference was on September 24th. Um, one is on December 3rd, and we were going to have uh, Herb as a guest. Um, and on the September version, we had seven great talks, which are partially on YouTube already. I'm planning to publish them in the next weeks. And so if I, I plan to kind of put the, the online conference um, for September 3rd online tomorrow, you already can submit talks, right? It's linked. And um, I'm going hope, to, I hope I have the time to announce it tomorrow that everything in detail is there. And then I hope to uh, basically uh, run this uh, until um, the end of the month, I think, is uh, the deadline. The deadline for submitting talks, maybe earlier. I have to decide. I have to see how I want to do that. But I think it's like the end of the month, um, which makes sense. And then on December third, if you, as an online community or as general as the C plus plus community, wants to join that, um, there is a free sponsor ticket available. And then, of course, there will be tickets available, which uh, support my work and this, uh, the work to the, for the C plus plus community. If you want to uh, support that, that's great. And um, yeah, then I, I've been thinking about other formats which you can do online because we are just living in a new world now and yeah. things are possible. So I thought about opening the idea of having a job fair and so on October 20th there will be a job fair and uh, for that I'm still looking for employers which want to participate in that. So um, I have announced it this week uh, in the news so that's uh, everything I think you need to know is in the news for that. And I guess you're going to be doing the job fair using uh, Remo as well? Okay. I find that interesting. I haven't... Um, I, went, I went to several job fairs in university, and then right after graduation, I went to a job fair. I don't recall seeing any advertised in the last while, decade or so. But it seems like in, in Remo, particularly if you've got um, employers who are looking for remote employees, which at this point effectively everyone's remote, right? Uh, it seems like a great way to get one-on-one -on -one talks in that kind of job fair environment. Like, oh, well, come on, let's go into a private room. We'll have a quick chat about your CV and see what if you're a good fit for our company or whatever. Um, seems like a pretty interesting con concept to me. I'm curious, are you, are you getting a good response so far? You said you're still looking for employers who are interested. I... I want to put like some weight on that statement. I'm still looking. Um, okay. Of course, it's it's not the best time. There is you know a lot of companies like in the automotive sector right now not hiring for some reason, and mm -hmm. some other companies in C++ right now have a good time like gaming companies, trading companies. Yeah. Um, 
and, and they're hiring and then there's some general folks which are like always hiring because their business is not like connected to the economic cycle that much um, and I just want to give it a try and um, employers are free to you know conduct the interviews there or just you know to uh, um, I, I probably will have a form online where you basically can select uh, the employers which are supporting me in C++ and upload your CV and let's get sent to them and they can, just can contact you because I kind of want to make um, uh, something av available on the website for everyone who misses this time frame who couldn't uh, come to Remo and also just offer some some spot for uh, maybe you know there's there's the tables which have a name and it's an employer name and you can go there and talk, talk to them get to know them as a company and then there might be other tables where no employer is sitting and you just can chat to other job searching folks uh, just it, it will be a kind of an open format and i want want to see how things play out for that sure are you putting any restrictions on all at all on the types of employers you want on like do they have to you know offer remote work as an option or is it just you know anyone looking for c++ developers have at it yeah no it's it's not, it's not a requirement that you're open, okay. that you're that you're supporting remote work i mean it would be great if you do that but um, yeah. if, if, if you're looking for an, to employ people in C++ and you want to have contacts in that area, then, uh, you know, please contact me. That's, that's like a, a new format and we're giving it a try. Also, of course, if you're looking for a job and you can attend in that time frame, um, come by, create a network, talk to people, and I hope to have some folks which might be looking for a C++ job right now with that. Yeah. So you want submissions as soon as possible, of course, uh, for employers, but do you have a deadline currently? Yeah, the deadline is next week, I think October 15th, to, for me to make the decision if we have enough interest in that uh, from employers at the conference uh, to, to, to basically host the event, uh, because I you know, also need to invest time in it. And right. Yeah. So this will air on October 9th, approximately. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you hear this, if you're interested, you should go to meetingc++.com and register your interest. Okay. Um, I want to go back to the, the C++, meeting C++ online a little bit. Um, you, you said you've already been doing that. I think you said there was one uh, a week or two ago. Uh, how did it go? The... Um, I, I think it was like really a short uh, time frame to to attend this, and it's a new con it's a new concept, and so it it went very well. It was a very good event. Uh, I hope for a bit more attendance next time. And I think it's not a lot of the of the community knew about that. Okay. Um, so it really was a nice event. Everyone who was there enjoyed it very much. Um, one thing I learned from it is that the next time I want to make the uh, the breaks longer so yeah. that people have more time to chat and um, also like a, a track where, where you basically can go to talk and you saw the talk and not want to see the next one. So there's a hallway track um, and otherwise it was just for me also a nice experience just to, to be able to watch a whole day just talks and go into the night with it and give some some folks which did not get there that's the other that's the other side of things um me c++ in the main track this year has only 11 slots and it's a main track not everybody is suited for the main track to speak mm -hmm. um, so new people which haven't spoken prior to that it's a difficult selection and also basically the community has its selection on this main track and it's kind of clear which people should speak on that it makes it difficult to choose on the other side not a lot of people submitted this year um, for the reason that it's 2020 and that was still like unclear at that point if you know if, if it's an online conference and if, if if that is a thing what is an online conference which is i think clearer now how to speak online and okay. nobody knew that in in june and may so some people didn't okay. submit for that reason because they may also just have been busy with with the virus and uh, so I wanted to give uh, some of my speakers who had submitted a chance to give their talks because 
Um, I, for for some reason, I know that I, I have to plan for Berlin to only be a single track, mm -hmm. and so I was looking for finding a way to to give some more folks the chance to to get those talks into reality and into the community so that those people can be listened to. Jason, you have any questions? A comment uh, that I've been thinking about since attending CVPCon. Um, I personally did not submit any talks to any conferences this year. Like you were saying, Jens, you didn't get a ton of submissions um, because the idea of presenting to remote uh, room seemed a bit daunting. Like I can't get the same kind of feedback and interaction that I like to get. But I yeah. did notice some of the CVP con presenters really tried to take that as a challenge and had like, um, uh, I think it was Phil Nash had like a live word cloud link that people could type in their answers into and it would build a word cloud of what people's responses hmm. were. Uh, and then I saw, I think, a couple of people did like, you know, raise your hand or comment in the box real quick, and I'll try, and they've switched over to the uh, to the comment field. And now I kind of wish, maybe maybe not 100% yet, but kind of wish that I had taken that as a challenge instead of just skipping the conference here. Um, so just just a thought maybe for people who are still thinking about the things that are upcoming this year or the the meeting C++ online events that you're talking about, yeah, and it's just maybe comment for other people who have had the same thoughts that I did. I, I'm happy to take your submission if you want to have a <laughs> year, December 3rd. Um, but yeah, I agree with that. And I, I think it's also kind of a good thing that some people decide not to speak in a year, and I think that's okay. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I think we, we do have a problem in our community that uh, some people speak every year, and uh, for, for some people that's their job, and that's fine, and they're totally okay with that, and that they're happy with that. And for some other people, I I see like often people like, you know, asking them for talks, or um, just, I, I don't want to people, you know, be pushed by the community into burnout and into oversubscription to to just do this. And so I I was happy about everyone that submitted. I was understanding that there's a problem for for some folks and especially for diverse folks to submit in such a year to commit to a talk when you already have to handle so much everything and else and you don't know how things are going to turn out and. Um, if, if you want to give it a try, it's also like a big chance, you know, to start online speaking. And yeah. I understand that yeah. not every speaker which is used to stand on a stage, and I, I mostly hear the, 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 those comments from the professional speakers which are used to do our big talks. And I understand them, but on the other hand, I have to say to the rest of the community, maybe that's your chance to start speaking. And, and right. at the end, we're, we're probably going to have people which find it weird to give their talks online. They're like oh, standing on a stage and talking to, to a room with real people. <laughs> <laughs> That's and true. Some, yeah. some other folks might only be able to give their talks that way because they have visa issues and are not able to, to visit our conferences in the US or in Europe. That's yeah. a really good point. So it's a big opportunity which we have as a community, as a, as a community I think. Uh, you kind of mentioned uh, you know, speakers having burnout uh, a moment ago, and you actually gave a talk about burnout last year, right? Do you want to tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so that's a, an ongoing problem for me, which I probably also don't really get rid of. I have a name for it. It's Phoenix Cycle, you know, kind of every year you burn out a bit because I organize a conference and that's my existence, so a lot of my work is for that. Um, and I, I decided just to talk about that because also uh, through you know, dealing with it, I got into photography, into hiking, and I got a lot of pictures which were expressive and could, you know, support such a talk. And um, I kind of see that a lot of people in our community have similar problems. And I was like, I thought it's like this 
part of my conference in Berlin is the part where people could do such talks and I wanted to to use that to just to, to, to say hey it's, it's okay to have that problem it's okay to say no it's okay to, to step back for a year or as much time you need so it's definitely also important to make people aware that self-awareness and self-care is a thing and that should take a serious part of their lives uh, seriousness and yeah that's that was my motivation to do the talk Yeah, that's definitely very important. Uh, definitely something everyone should be aware of and, and have a strategy for uh, for dealing with it. Yeah. So on the topic of meaning C++, you said it's that is your life, your cycle, your Phoenix burn cycle, which I yes. I can totally see that because you invest so much of it into it and then uh, take a holiday afterward generally as we see on Twitter when every year when you show us where you happen to be so shortly after meeting C++. <laughs> um, uh, what, what is the status of meeting C++ this year looking like? It's a hybrid conference is still the plan? Is that Maybe, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, let me quickly talk about this year's conference. Um, yeah. So from today's standpoint, it is a hybrid conference. So the tickets for Berlin are available since last week. Okay. And you can get your ticket to be in Berlin. Also, I just want to, you know, say that there's a hack. If you, if you, if you could get your employer to spend money on that ticket, you could attend the conference still online and just be in Berlin or book a hotel. It's just, I don't, I don't want to promote that, but just <laughs> saying it's, Maybe, you know, I've seen that for a lot of other people which, uh, you know, get the online tickets, which are a bit cheaper, of course, uh, have problems to then actually attend the conference because they're like, ah, you, you want to join the meeting or, or you should join the meeting because it's important and they're distracted from work. So if, if, if you want to take the risk and come to Berlin, you still can attend online. So if, if you come to Berlin and then, uh, you know, the, the setup is, is, is nice and you want to attend, that's fine. But if you want to come to Berlin and um, you, 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 it's, it's your choice if you then go to the conference itself and attend there partially or fully or attend from your room because maybe you, you don't think the situation is safe enough for you. Um, the hotel and, and any any ruling for, for, you know, any, any rules will be there and I kind of will make sure that those rules are set and also um, in place and uh, me and my team will ensure that uh, attendees follow those rules. That's also what I want to clearly say. If you come to Berlin, uh, mask wearing will not be optional. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we kind of, it's, it's, it's a difficult year for that and different year. And in case that the conference does not happen in Berlin. The conference will happen online. Okay. okay. So if you bought a ticket for Berlin and, and you want a partial refund because the conference only happens online, if it's only happening online, that of course is not a problem. That's available then. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much about the hybrid part. It's um, I, I'll be next week in Berlin and will be then be able to tell you a bit more um, about what are the plans for Berlin. What are the current restrictions in Berlin? Do you know for like how big of a gathering you're allowed to have or that kind of thing? Um, yeah, well, it's basically the room size. And I think it would be okay. about 200, 200 folks would be uh, doable. Uh, after the loss currently. I think we will probably go down to less than that. Um, and I will have to talk to the hotel and how we, uh, you know, kind of uh, refresh the contract uh, for that because the, the, the contract basically is still stating and that's not going to happen this year because right. even if we could do that, finding 600 people which, which want to come to Berlin is a challenge, right. I guess. I want so, to come to Berlin. That's <laughs> not really the problem at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah it's just so many folks which, which probably want to come but can't because travel restrictions and mm -hmm. it's also like uh, none of my keynote speakers are able to come to Berlin because of travel restrictions so uh, there, there are some speakers which plan to come and I'm happy to see them in Berlin. Um, one of them is Jonathan which I saw uh, yesterday. Mm. Oh, okay. 
Um, since it's going to be some sort of hybrid, uh, we hope, is there going to be any way for the online attendees to interact with the attendees in Berlin? Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be available. Okay. Um, I, I could like put some table with a webcam on and we make sure it's yeah. connected to a room in Remo and you sit on that and you can talk to whatever person is there. But that person probably has to wear a mask because it's at the conference, so it's a bit difficult. Uh, but as I said, every person on the online on, on the conference will have also access to the online part. Right, right. So um, there will be some interaction um, and some people probably will, you know, post pictures on Twitter, I will. Um, <laughs> And then there's the evening program, and I think that the evening program will be only online. Um, so okay. the, the, the audiences will, during the conference, surely mix. Well, yeah, if you manage to have a person component at all, I, I just realized this. I think the last C++ conference that snuck in right before everything closed down was Embo++. Pretty I sure that's it. right. Yeah, okay. I so was there. It, was, it was a bit of a interesting experience and I was very very happy to 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 go there because after that you you lacked so so much of social contact that you were kind of happy to yeah. to see um, some of your fellow programmers and people you know from conferences and just have that experience and on the other hand it was a bit scary because the virus was just going around and we mm -hmm. did not know as much as we know now and it's, I think it's now a bit safer but also um, we know a bit more about what rules do apply and those rules apply now. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I asked about what your, if you knew what the limits were in Berlin right now, because I think in Colorado at the moment, you cannot have an indoor gathering of more than 100 people, no matter what. It doesn't matter the size or if everyone's wearing masks or whatever. Like, I think there's a hard limit. Um, I could be wrong, but I thought that was the case. Um, the limit is kind of how many people and what distance you can sit on a on, on a table alone right okay and, makes sense um, yeah that makes sense then there's like the laws and I, i've seen some reports of some uh some gathering of 600 folks uh, in the end of september in berlin but that's wow. in a different hotel they didn't have the space and then there's some other um seatings and I just I, I don't think that we that we get to 200 it would be nice to have 200 attendees in Berlin don't get me wrong sure but um, I think it's unrealistic I, I hope for maybe a hundred that would be nice to see um, my my recollection I could be wrong but my recollection is you have a, a large percentage of your attendees are German normally yes okay so at least uh those who are interested are coming from a country where they don't have to worry so much about border crossings and 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 so much but yeah definitely still going to be hard i'm sure for most people yeah yeah well anything else you want to let us know about meeting c++ this year before we let you go any uh keynotes you want to share or anything like that yes i i announced the the keynote uh, the, the closing keynote this um, for this year today. Oh, it's okay. going to be uh, Gabi Dosres. Okay, oh, awesome. Talking about uh, writing software or programming in the large in C++20. I'm looking forward to that talk and I wrote an announcement about that today. And something else I might want to, to plug. Um, I think from next year on, I'm going to also be available as a consultant for doing work with either code or with the C++ community. So if your company is looking for advice uh, regarding the C++ community, because I think I have a unique experience with that as running the conference for this while and attending many other events and knowing so many folks in the community that I would be able and willing to, to do a bit of consulting in that direction. And from a coding perspective, is there any particular focus or specialty or anything that you want our listeners to be aware of that you are available for? Um, I think I know Qt quite well. And, okay. Uh, some some of the new standards, maybe, but 
I have to to look into that in case by case to 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 decide if it if it makes sense to um, to you know take the case myself or maybe to to tell someone else well some other trainer to mm-hmm. who, who can help you with that right um, okay, awesome well, it's been great having you on the show again today Jens. Look, good luck with the uh, upcoming conference. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks for coming on.